high. The early results are in from the EEV blog survey and 62% of you said you want to see random teardowns and also 62% said that you want to see reverse engineering. Well, the previous video was reverse engineering. So this one, I thought I'd do a random teardown. I just grabbed a random bit of kit from the EEV blog lab here. And today, ta-da, we have this Sennheiser true diversity receiver. None of that dual diversity rubbish or no diversity rubbish because everyone knows that in 2021 you can't have no diversity because well you'll get cancelled and stuff anyway this is the ew 100 g3 i think that's like generation 3 i think they're up to at least g4 now and this is the uh desktop uh well you can actually i think you can even get a rack mount version of this uh, it's got dual antennas on it and uh, which is better than the one that i use on my camera which is uh, you've seen this uh before i've done a teardown of this before it's the sennheiser ew one it's actually exactly the same part number which is like really kind of confusing anyway Anyway, I guess you know that they uh, match and I've done a teardown of these this is the uh, receiver unit that goes on top of my camera I've done a teardown of the receiver and the uh, transmitter and these are a really good bit of kit I really like them so I'll link the video up here and down below and at the end if you haven't seen that highly recommended so let's crack this puppy open and see what's inside it's going to have lots of diversity so for all you diversity fanboys oh, going to run wild anyway takes about four Four watts maximum. Uh, we've got balanced output here, XLR jobby, and a uh, TRS jack here for the unbalanced data. And data, I don't know, that goes into some, you know, it's like a system type thing. I think the newer model has the Etherneties and stuff. And uh, you do have to get uh, the specific frequency range, by the way, if you get in these. Uh, different countries have different uh, legal requirements for spectrum use and uh, stuff like that. So this one's here, this is for the Australian market the 626 to 666 megahertz the b2 range so let's crack this open i don't expect there to be much inside i suspect it might be fairly empty because it's you know there's not much more in it um compared to any more screws there no compared to uh the uh version which sits on top of my camera but the one that's on my camera is only a single antenna so it's no it has no diversity whatsoever so it's going to get absolutely cancelled and uh it'll all of its social media accounts are going to get cancelled and uh poor old uh no diversity receiver on the camera so this is a true diversity and I'll explain with Dave Cad probably in a minute so stick around I'll explain the difference between no diversity dual diversity and uh, uh, the true diversity which this bad boy is true diversity so let's lift it this the oh hello hello it just way hey hey that's rather nice check check this out yeah and yeah it's got nothing in it um I, I like this. Look, look, they've got a little matching um, thing. It doesn't just lift off. It it goes down. Look, it goes down and then slides in like that. And you can't lift that out. That's a really nice bit of design. Somebody was thinking there. I really like that. And it's got these little tabs in there like that. That do that. That's excellent. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> that's expensive. That's probably less in there than I thought. Um, interestingly... They do have different, look, they've got more standoffs here. So I don't know, is there another model? They could, I think they do have like several different models or something. So maybe there's one that needs a bigger, that has a bigger board or something that goes right on the base there. But anyway, um, it's all on the one PCB here. Then we've been blobbed for our uh, LCD front panel here. And it's got, what is that, Agcom Germany. Oh, by the way, designed in Germany, assembled in the United States of America, disassembled in Australia, not Austria. Um, if anyone knows why it was not assembled in Germany, I don't know. Is there company politics going on there or something? More tax advantageous? I don't know. If you have any clue, leave it in the comments. Anyway, there's nothing on there. There's an SO8 down there, whatever that's doing, and three blobs for the um, LCD interface, and that's all she wrote. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a completely uh, custom design. Looks like they have a custom window in there too. So there you go. They've gone to a lot of effort to engineer their own custom 
window there and uh, lots of test points on the top side of the board there. So obviously they'd have an automated uh, test jig that tests these, um, just standard tactile switches with uh, big, nice big extended buttons on them. But that's all she wrote. What's that puppy doing? Yeah, you know, that's just a boring LM324. Um, so I don't know what's going on there. Why do you need a, a 324 on there? Well, there's lots of RF cans in there. So I think uh, probably just the best way to do this is just to get the uh, board out and uh, do a couple of screws here. Uh, the B and C's down there, locking nuts on those. And I'll whack it under the Tagano, shall we? All right, here we go under the Tagano microscope and I've taken off uh, the metal cans here and this actually uh, reminds me, it's <laughs> I had to go back and check my previous video of the wireless uh, one at Teardown and it's, I think it's near identical as you'd probably uh, expect. All the um, cans actually look identical right down to um, the shape, the pattern that they've got, this alien looking pattern that they've got on top of this can here. So there's no surprises whatsoever for finding that this is pretty much near identical in terms of just general receiver functionality to the uh, wireless version of this. They've just shrunk this down into that wireless uh, receiver. But because this is a true diversity receiver compared to the just regular diversity receiver uh, or a dual diversity receiver as it's called in the uh, wireless one, then um, yeah, uh, there's going to be some differences there. And sure enough, the differences are it's got an extra receiver here. Here's the two antenna inputs here, and we've got two receivers. So let me show you what the functionality is. We have Dave Cad. So what is a diversity receiver? Well, it basically the diversity name comes from the fact that you have more than one antenna. You've actually got at least two antenna i.e. you've diversified your receiving antennas so that they can pick up potentially different signals between them because they're not physically in the same location. They're separated by a certain amount uh, in, in some sort of spatial array or just physically separated like this. They do technically receive different signals. Now, if you're receiving the same signal but from a different location antenna, then you have options. If this one gets a bad signal for some reason, then you can continue to pick up from this antenna here. So you've diversified your options. It's more better. Couldn't pass it up because I'm Australian. So we have to have a look at what's called the multi-path effect. And this is what causes these uh, dropout problems in a receiver. You've got little transmitter Dave here. You've got uh, Dave's camera over here, which only has a single antenna on it. Now, of course, the signal passes line of sight like this, straight from antenna to antenna. Bob's your uncle. No worries, right? Uh, no. Trap for young players. This is where you can come a gutsa. You've got uh, reflective RF reflective surfaces like the ground and potentially the ceiling. Like in this office space I've got here, up in the ceiling is actually, this is a multi-story office complex. It's a concrete slab, but there's also a gigantic metal sheet right above and also below on the floor below me. If you've seen in my roof before in various videos, gigantic metal Sheet, they're just like separating the thing. I'm basically in this like Faraday sandwich like this of metal, like this. But it's not just inside places like this, it's outside. This, uh, the actual ground itself can act as a reflector. So yeah, you might not have anything above you on the sky, but the ground. And what the problem here is, is that you get reflections of the signals off these uh, objects. They can be all sorts of different RF reflective objects. And if two signals receive at the same time that 180 degrees a phase apart, then they can cancel each other out. And this can lead to dropouts. And that's why if you have a second antenna here, you might get a dropout in this physical location, but you know, 30 centimeters away, no worries. You can receive that signal, no problems, because you haven't entered this sort of like dead spot where the signal cancels out and drops out. And that's the multi-path effect, the multi-path problem. And that's what diversity, having more than one antenna, solves.
So please excuse the crudity of the model. Didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. This is a block diagram of a simple RF receiver. You've got the antenna, goes through a filtery thing, goes into a, a like an RF preamplifier, then goes into a mixer, which is then mixed with the local oscillator, and then you can down convert this and amplify it. And at the end, you get your audio frequency out. Okay, no worries. What does a dual diversity receiver look like? Or just a diversity receiver? And this is how the uh, wireless Sennheiser one will work. I was actually wrong at the start. I forgot that this receiver, watch the teardown video, is actually a, a, a diversity receiver, a dual diversity. It's only got one antenna. So where's the other antenna? Hmm, that's the tricky part. You'll have to watch the teardown video. I've linked it in up here somewhere. Go check it out. So what happens in a diversity or dual diversity receiver is that there's two antennas like this and they basically go into an RF switch like this which is controlled by the microprocessor in the thing and it goes into the same, exactly the same RF system, the bandpass filter, the uh, amplifier and the mixer which is the local oscillator, it down converts and you get your audio frequency out or whatever, however the uh, RF system works, right? Typical block diagram. The problem with this is that the processor actually at some point in this um, path here it's got to measure the uh, signal level am I getting a good signal you know what is my signal level output is it any good oh I'll switch to if it's starting looks like it's starting to drop out oh I'll switch over to the antenna is that any good and there's various algorithms you can do do you uh, switch to the last one that had a last known good signal or do you like alternate between them or whatever there is however going to be some time delay when you actually switch between these and can actually measure them so a dual diversity receivers it's good, but it's not as good as a true diversity receiver, which is what we're looking at here today. And I have another Dave CAD for that. So here it is, the true diversity receiver. Once again, exactly the same thing. It has two antennas like this, but it actually has two complete receiver systems. It's got two complete filtering systems. It's got two amplifiers like this. It's got two mixers like this, single local oscillator to drive uh, both, of course. And then the switching happens at somewhere on the output here like this. And this way, the processor can actually measure at the same time can measure the signal from both of these. It doesn't have to wait, it doesn't have to wait for it to switch over, settle and then measure. And what it, you know, so it can basically sample at the same time in real time and then it can choose like practically instantaneously the best signal from whichever antenna you've got. And of course you can do this with more than one antenna. But two, there's all sorts of mathematics behind this of course and uh, you know theory and, and you can spit a number out how much better having two antennas what, you, what your odds are because it's basically a randomized type thing. You don't know unless you're in a completely controlled environment, you don't know where that dropout is going to happen, right? It can happen basically anywhere. So it basically comes down to statistics, your odds of having a dropout and which system is better. But anyway, a true diversity system is going to be better because there's no delay and you can sample at the same time. So yeah, this is more better. But the obvious problem is, is this cost more? You've got two uh, RF amplifier systems, got two mixers and everything else. And that's what we see in here, we've actually got, ta-da, two complete amplifiers. There they are. So let's zoom in on one of them here. So we're going to have a controlled impedance trace coming out of here. There's going to be a ground plane on the inner layer under there. Comes in here. We've got some filtering action happening here. There you go. I'll leave it for those that are playing along at home to reverse engineer that little filter there. There you go. We've got inductor. Inductor, 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 capacitors, capacitors, capacitors. Oh, we've got some, oh look, little diodes there. Lots of ground stitching along there for low RF impedance. But anyway, it comes out of there and it buggers off into the can here. So the reason that the via drops under and goes under here is because you don't want it running under the can like this because the metal can, if it's got a little sharp bit on it from the manufacturing and whatever, it could actually cut through the solder mask on the PCB and contact the trace. So yeah, that could ruin the day. So that's probably why they're dro dropping under there. But there you go, that's our receiver. And I had to, I could not find any info on this at all. So I had to ask the Twitter, 
So thank you very much, Andrew uh, Samavon, uh, Silent Z maybe, or Samazon, thank you very much, uh, who pointed out. So that symbol turns out to be from Triquint uh, Semiconductor, which is now um, Corvo. I I don't know, never heard of um, either of them, <laughs> don't even think I've heard of Triquint, but that symbol is definitely on top of the uh, chip, and the 213 CMY, it's the only one. So it's a down converter, um, which is really interesting, which contains a mixer in it, which is kind of strange, because as you'll see, we've already got a mixer um, further down in the process here, but it's got to be, because it is this package, which is a uh, SCT598 for those playing along at home, um, there you go, which has the big ground pin on here. The reason that ground pin's bigger is not for power reasons, it'd be for inductive reasons, for a low impedance ground path. That's why it has a big, thick pin on it. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Thing of beauty. Joy forever. Fantastic. Anyway, yeah, so that, that's the reason that it's got that. And, uh, yeah, it's it must be using the mixer because it's got stuff up at pin one. Here it is. There you go. It's doing some mixing goodness. So there you go. It does actually have an inductor and a cap in there between the mixer in. So it's all being used. So anyway, I'm not going to reverse engineer the whole RF section of this thing. Uh, they, you know, those playing along at home can do that if you so desire. Knock yourself out. But anyway, the interesting thing is that it is using that mixer and that RF amp as well. But as I said, we've got two of those. They are absolutely identical. Check them out, as you'd expect. Absolutely identical, everything. The filters um, outside is exactly the same. And if we flip over to the bottom side here, you can see that there is, there's a uh, saw filter, that would be. I won't look up, I won't try and uh, get that part. But anyway, that would be a, uh, I'm sure that is a saw, surface acoustic wave filter. It's in a ceramic package. You often get them in the ceramic packages like that. And, oh, is that some other filter packages? I don't know what they are. Basically, yeah, there are two identical ones here. Now, obviously, this is sort of like the main channel and this is the secondary channel here. And they've got them labeled one and two. Funny that. So there's some extra goodness on the bottom, but, but you can see it's got two absolutely identical receiver systems and, and filter systems, and that's what we're, and mixers, that, then that's what we've got here. So there you go. It's, it's all there. It is true diversity. And of course, just be careful because everyone knows that in 2021, if you focus too much on diversity, that's your only focus, then, well, you're going to go broke. And thanks to Twitter, I now know that this actual chip has a name. It's Gary. It's Gazza. Good on you, Gazza. And Gazza's actually got a Twitter profile. Check it out. And there's just a basic application block diagram. And I think pretty much we're seeing near identical uh, to that on this layout here. Anyway, let's have a look. If we go in here, here's our main oscillator, 230 meg. There it is, and you can see that's powering this 4127 chip here. Exactly, I believe, this is all exactly the same sort of stuff that's used in the on-camera uh, wireless receiver as well. So anyway, you can see that obviously this has to power both of these channels. So there's another one over here. There's an identical 4127 chip, and you can see these ground here. This is a dead giveaway that there's a controlled impedance trace running through there. And of course, it's going to be the oscillator, because the oscillator, the local oscillator, has to bugger off to both of these chips here, just as we saw in our block diagram. A local oscillator goes into the two mixers. So the 4127, let's go to the videotape. I believe this is a uh, BH4126 uh, IF detector for 900 meg spe spread spectrum cordless phones. Looks like it's bang on the money. Um, so this thing, of course, once again, this has, well, it's got a local oscillator in it, or you can probably feed in an external oscillator like we've got here. And uh, then it's got a mixer as well. And there's a, uh, once in, in need a filter out here as well. And there's going to be a lot of stuff on the bottom there. That's probably what those filter blocks in there are doing. Those filter blocks there would be part of the 4127 uh, filtering around that chip would be my guess. 
So there's a typical uh, application circuit for that. And if we map that down to the PCB, yeah, you know, it, it's going to be doing something similar. And they definitely are using the internal mixer because that's pin 16. So that's buggering off there somewhere, which does something. So yeah, um, so they've got a couple of mixers in this bad boy. So anyway, they're our dual mixers in there with our local oscillator um, and it's the same oscillator for both of them exactly as per our predicted block diagram we've got another block up here that's just is that just entirely well it's not entirely passive there's some other SOT23 jobbies in there once again I'm not going to reverse engineer this and that has actually nothing on the bottom there and this uh, previous block here is ident near identical to this block down here. <laughs> so yeah, they're just reusing the design as you'd expect. Uh, there's no difference. And there it is, exactly the same <laughs> between them, the 4127 with the local oscillator in there. And this block here, whatever this one's doing uh, in the previous one, it's got basically a duplicate over here. So yeah, once again, I'm not gonna reverse engineer this whole thing. To get a schematic geez that'd be a job and a half wouldn't it but anyway nice modular design lots of cans uh and oh by the way this down up oh, down here at there's a diode there an inductor going into what will be the center tap of this so going into here so that must the only thing that's for and you'll notice this it's buggering off under here and if we follow the money follow the money pops up here and exactly the same thing happening over here the only reason you would feed something into here via an inductor it's not having the antenna out this is for feeding power in to the antenna um so yeah um it must be for like a remote uh rf amplifier you know if you want to put, mount your amplifier somewhere else like a masthead um amplifier like you'd have might have on your uh, tv at home or something like that then um yeah that's what it must be doing so i'm sure it has that feature i didn't know but <laughs> obviously it's in the hardware that's the only reason for that hardware to exist there and then over in the processory section, we've got a, oh, an 062 Japan Radio Corp. This is more, more analogy stuff here. A couple of Japan Radio Corps. Uh, they're an 062. FET amp, are they? And there's our little uh, watch crystal, 32.768 kilohertz, 4 megahertz oscillator for our processor in here, which is an NXP jobby. And I believe that's exactly the same one that was used in the on camera uh, receiver as well that's in its own little metal can you don't want the electrons falling out no wackers and they've like series terminated like everything in here like every line on here has <laughs> is terminated look at that wow and then you've just got some regulation and other uh jelly bean stuff around here this goes off to of course the connector off to the um lcd front panel Good old 7805, there you go, no wackers, some more regulation around there. That's all your power stuff, and the rest of it is just, this is just your audio stuff. Um, your, the power in here for your DC power jack that's fused, and it's got some protection by the look of it, and uh, diode protection, and then you've got all your analogy goodness, is that discrete? That's a discrete amplifier. It's a discrete transistor amplifier, I think. Is there anything? No, there's nothing on the bottom. Yeah, so I think the balanced amp and unbalanced amp there are discrete transistor amplifiers. <laughs> nice. Oh, and the previous one had a compander, which is, well, which compresses the audio. And you've got a matching one down there, 575. No, it's not a 74 AC 575. It's actually a 575 Compander uh, chip, which squishes the audio levels and then uh, re expands them at the other end. There it is. <laughs> cool audio. I think that there's many companies that make this, but cool audio. <laughs> I want to use something from cool audio because they're just cool. Oh, look at that. Wireless microphones for the application. Go figure. Now this down here, this is interesting. Check this out. It's upside down, so all the electrons are gonna fall out. Let me flip that around. And range and version. Now, these are, uh, these are resistors here, which allows 
the, you would think, allows the processor inside to know what version of the PCB is being used and what range it is. I assume range means, um, uh, you know, the different models for around the world, like B range or whatever, here for Australia. And you can see one side of these resistors is grounded and the other side is uh, going off to a via here. You might think this goes off to the processor, but hmm, let's flip it over. You'll see that it, unless it goes off in an inner layer, which I don't think it does, it goes off to a test pad on the bottom. And that's it. That is so, and there's a corresponding ground uh, test point there as well. This is so, the better, and there's all sorts of test, oh, there's all sorts of test points all over this board. Check them out. So there's obviously at the uh, production stage, yeah, all the silver bits on there, they're all test points. So they all go to pogo pins. So at the, uh, on the production test line, this used to be my day job, is designing a bit of nail stuff. This board will plug in here, it'll line up with like the holes in this thing. Uh, yep, you know, you can use these as alignment holes. We've got holes over here and the mounting holes as well. You put those down, all goes onto the bed of nails tester, and this can uh, this will hooked up uh, to all sorts of RF test gear and stuff like this, which will uh, completely automate test this board, and it can measure. It knows which range it is, so then the test automated test software knows which frequency range to test for because you've programmed because it's populated with it just reads those resistor values. It knows, oh yeah, I've got a an Australian B series model. I'm going to test it for all over the. B-series uh, frequency range and stuff like that. So it can test that and uh, and then the version number, it knows what version number of the board it's got. And Bob's your uncle. Uh, does it program? Uh, well, yeah, there's a header. Uh, there's that. I assume that's a little JTAG programming header down there. Do they program it? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a program. They probably program the processor on the board as well. No problems. So yeah, there's no reason for the micro on board to, you know, know or care about this sort of stuff, but the production test jig and production test hardware and software, it really needs to know what version of the board it is so I can select the appropriate test. So there you go. Isn't that cool? There's not much else on there. Oh, and we just missed it on the bottom here. 4580 audio op amp. Of course, there's a 4580 in here. Um, and that's um, the audio frequency output like the actual audio output of the RF. So that's the final audio output. There you go, they've got another unpopulated footprint there. Don't know what the business is there. Is that an alternative footprint regulator? And there you, because this is a regulator obviously, maybe that's an alternative idea. Yeah, don't know what's going on there. Oh, and I forgot, this of course has a digital uh, you know, it allows you to select, digitally select the frequency. So it's got to have a DDS in there, a direct digital synthesis uh, generator. And sure enough, there it is, the ADF 4117 that allows uh, the software on here to generate, the firmware to generate um, a specific uh, frequency, RF uh, frequency that or channel that you're transmitting on because you can actually dial in the frequency and you can scan as well. It's got scan modes that you can scan for a signal and then automatically lock it in and stuff like that and uh, you know automatically identify the receiver and pair them and stuff like that. So yeah, there's our DDS generator chip. So there you go. So that's really rather cool. I like that. That is the uh, EW100 desktop version, I guess, because the, uh, the model numbers are the same. It might be some subtle difference. I don't know. Sennheiser's a bit weird when they come to, like, naming stuff. It's very strange. Anyway, um, yeah, that's a, that's a well-designed bit of kit. I like that. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up. As always, discuss down below. Catch you next time. Hello.